All right, here we go. <clears throat> Let's move on to magnetos. Because that battery ignition stuff you guys got down now, right? So if we're going to talk about the magneto part, we got to talk about the mag before we can talk about the neato. Uh, just came up with that. <laughs> so talk about magnets. And this will be kind of a precursor to when I come back and we start non-destructive testing, we're going to go into a lot more into magnets. So magnets, well, what's the definition? Definition, an object. Object. An object that attracts ferrous metals. That attracts, attracts ferrous metals. Ferrous means it has iron in it. So if it doesn't have iron in it, it's not going to work. Can't have an aluminum magnet. Can't have a magnesium magnet. It's got to be something with iron in it. Uh, let's see. What is it? It produces. It produces a magnetic field external to itself. It produces a magnetic field. Well, I wrote this. I'll say not really, but I'll go with it. External to itself. Itself that reacts. That reacts with magnetic substances. With magnetic magnetic substances. Well, that's not entirely true. And I got out of a book, but then I read this. So if I took a magnet, we'll call it a, a bar magnet here, you're always going to have a north and a south end to every magnet. And within the magnet, you would have lines of flux would flow this way. And they would get to the north, and they would come out and go around to the south. And so they're going to kind of want to take the path of least resistance, but magnetic lines of flux never cross themselves. They always build up like that around it, around the words on the page too. And they're going to build up. So that would make sense, producing a magnet, magnetic field external to itself. And if I were working in non-destructive testing, I would say that this has longitudinal magnetization. We'll get into that later. And, and that is true then. But if I took another magnet, or the, or the same magnet if I wanted to, and made it into a bar magnet, just kind of bent it around. And I had the north here and the south here, but I connected it. There, so the magnet is connected all the way around. Then the magnetic lines of flux are gonna roll around inside of here, and they really don't leak out. If I connect it strong enough right here at that junction point, it's totally connected. You're not going to have this magnetic field external to itself. And that would be called circular magnetization. That's the circle that goes around and around and around. And since we're talking about that, uh, you guys played with the little Gauss meter where, where you put your, um, your rotor in that board and you move that little meter back and forth on it. Did you guys do that yet? That's called a Gauss meter. The Gauss meter is a way to measure the strength of magnetic lines of flux leaking out. So if I took a Gauss meter and I put that over here and I tried to measure the magnetic flux, so I might get quite a, quite a good indication, you know, 10, 5, 0. I might get, you know, an, an indication. But I take that same Gauss meter and I stick it right next to this, and I may get one or none. I may get no leakage. So in the circular magnetization, it doesn't leak out. So that makes this almost a false sentence. It produces a magnetic field external to itself that reacts with magnetic substances. Well, yes, it's true with the bar magnet, not true with the circular magnet. So in that circular magnet, no mind of flux would actually come outside of the magnet? Nope. It's gonna run within? Yeah, it runs around inside. It's really hard to detect. Oh, it's my, it's my, it's my, yeah. <laughs> my, my buddy Pillboy. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to think of a funny name. What would the circular magnet be used for? If there isn't any magnetic 
We use it in non-destructive testing. Well, I would make it, I would, well, now we're getting way ahead of myself, but the reason why I'm telling you I know this is because that's how you do non-destructive testing. So this is how we'd find a crack, right, at this location right there. But in 2D, it's kind of hard to figure. It's just, if I did it, if you could draw it in 3D, I would show you it's the crack would run longitudinal. But I didn't want to throw out some false information there. So, all right, let me see, da, da, da. so the magnetic field. Hold on here, magnetic field. Magnetic field. What is this magnetic field? Well, I kind of showed you already. So it's invisible lines of force or lines of flux that leave the North Pole and enter the South Pole. Now, it's thought to do that. Nobody really knows. Nobody really even knows if it moves. It's just the theory that they've come up with. So it comes out of the North, goes into the South. Invisible lines of flux, invisible lines of flux that leave the North Pole and enter the South. So invisible lines of force, also lines of flux. You know what a flux capacitor is? So, so there we go. Now you have the flux. Now you can put it together. It's a capacitor that would hold on to the flux. So a flux capacitor. In a flux capacitor, would the magnetic lines of flux lead or lag? Okay, there's probably about a 30 year going. I don't know. Is he serious? What the hell's going on? <laughs> Thank you. It would depend. Well, that's how you determine if you're going to the future or the past. You add magnetic. All right, never mind. Okay. okay, for those of you who are just trying to figure out what's going on, I was joking around when I started with the flux capacitor. It's from a movie. <laughs> but I haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah, visible lines of force, lines of flux that leave the North Pole. The North Pole and enter the South. And enter the South. And I'll put here, this is purely, at least all of my reading and research is purely, by the way, it was really hard to do research uh, yesterday because Facebook was down. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it dropped 5% on stocks. Yeah, I wouldn't, like would not invest in that. Theoretically. You gotta, you gotta buy on the dip. Uh, this is pure theoretical <clears throat> and not actually known if there is any movement. Just in case you wanted to know. All right, this is important here. Magnetic flux is strongest at the poles. Magnetic flux is strongest at the poles. So that little meter I had, what's that called? Gauss. Gauss meter. I take that Gauss meter, G-A-U-S-S, -S, and I put it really close to the pole. It's going to read more, and as I pull it away or even move it around to the side, it's going to read less. It'll be strongest right near the pole. Right near the pole. Um, flux lines do not intersect. I can mention that. And flux lines take the path of least resistance. And by the way, air, air has more resistance than steel. All right, so we have different types of magnets, most of which you have already encountered. <clears throat> How are we doing there, Eric? 
I can write faster? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Let's start. We have permanent magnets. Permanent magnets. And that is a magnet that contains, that maintains almost constant magnetism without any application of a magnetizing force. Man, do they have some strong magnets now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, known as like rare, rare earth magnets. Uh, maintains almost constant magnetism. Without the application. of a magnetizing force, of a magnetizing force. I would say it has high retentivity. It can, it, once it's magnetized, it wants to stay that way. Um, oh, there's natural magnets. <coughs> Which brings me around to the first magnets they ever found. They call them lodestone, so natural magnets. A, a magnet found in nature. Why was lodestone funny? So it's called a lodestone, L-O-A-D, lodestone. Lodestone or leading stone. And once you called a leading stone, now you can kind of see where it got its name from. So they figured out that if you would suspend the lodestone or leading stone by a string, that it would always point towards north. What? Can you do that with a regular magnet? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> All right, then we have the electromagnet. Electromagnet. All right, what's an example of electromagnet? Transformer? Kind of, yeah. Half of a transformer. Half? Half? It's just a coil. Yeah. Thing One coil up. run. What? Thing they pick up cars with in the junkyard? Yeah, that's exactly it. Thing they pick up cars in the junkyard. <laughs> Has a big magnet in there. Turn it on. Would that be AC or DC? Well, let's think about that. If we had a magnet that we connected to AC, wouldn't it tend to repulse every... <laughs> that is true. It would keep... <laughs> yes. It wouldn't work so well. <laughs> Throw it away, pick it up. Throw it away, pick it up. So that means that a really good electromagnet would have to be DC. So a magnet... Made by passing current through a coil. Sometimes I want to just really pull stuff out and get more simplistic. And I think, God, what if I wrote it in my test or something? I'm like, God, I didn't tell him that. Uh, so but you have the left hand rule, left hand rule. <laughs> you know, I'm, no, I'm not gonna ask you about left hand rule. I, I wouldn't. There's so many of these left hand rules, right hand rules. It's just, I don't wanna confuse you with that. But anyway, basically it's the left hand rule. This particular one is when a coil is held in the left hand with the fingers pointing in the direction of current flow, psh, the thumb will point to north. That's not really important. The strength of the magnet is proportional to the amount of current. Yeah, that would make sense. So, strength strength of magnet is proportional. It's directly proportional. 
to current flow. Higher the current, stronger the magnet. So most of you now have been over to the NDT lab with the, it, we call it a Magnaflux machine. It's made by Magnaflux. It could have bought them. It, it's, that's kind of what people tend to call that machine, even though it's not the proper name because it's made by Magnaflux, but so is the machine next to it, which is completely different. So, but somebody said, yeah, you're gonna use the Magnaflux machine. Eh, just go with it. They're talking about a um, magnetic particle inspection machine is what it really is. So you've seen me use that to demagnetize your coils, right? Okay, so what that machine is, it's a giant magnet making machine and uh, just using it in a different function to demagnetize something because that is one of the functions of it. And so what I'm doing to demagnetize, well, I can back up, what I would do if I wanted to magnetize something, what I would do is just stick it in that coil and put up to, I don't know, about 2,000 amps through that thing and it'll handle. Um, or I could do it through the heads and we'll talk about that when I get back. So, but I just used the, the coil and I used AC through it. It's uh, AC that diminishes and so it's constantly, of course, reversing direction in that magnet. So it reverses just because it's AC and at the same time it diminishes and that scrambles, well, I'll talk about it in a minute, the domains inside and demagnetizes it. Um, so what I did is I demagnetized it. Now out in the field, we don't demagnetize those. That would be silly. I wanted to be strong. What, what point did demagnetizing it do? The only reason why I demagnetized it is so that you could experience remagnetizing it. Out in the field, we would just take that, that rotor out of the magneto and set it aside, do our inspection, and when we're putting it back together, we just stick it back in the same machine that you guys have, charge it up, remagnetize it as strong as it is, and put it back in the, in the magneto. We would never take the time to demagnetize it. That's just ridiculous uh, and a waste of time. Yeah. So you apply a DC current to a magnet to magnetize it, yeah. AC current to diminish it? You, okay, and I'll, I'll get into this when we get into non-destructive testing. Okay. So it won't be on this one. I'm just introducing magnets. I don't know why I decided at some point years ago to do that at this point. But, uh, but to answer your question, I can use AC to magnetize as well. Oh. It's complicated. Yeah. But, and then you get into, but I'll tell you about it. So AC has this thing called the skin effect, and it brings a magnetism to the surface where DC goes in deep. So I'll talk about that. Uh, let's see, we got that down, let's see, two, one of the things that I always find uh, confusing, A, B, C, D, E, F, is what's, what end of the magnet are you talking about? And even reading books, they'll change it around, they'll say, I've heard it both ways, that the north end of the magnet, because it's north, means that it will point toward, because opposites attract, right? So if we have the earth and I have the north end, well, which way is the north end going to point? Towards south or point north? Yeah. Going to point towards south. Well, then that means the south goes to the north. So the north end of the magnet goes south and the south goes north? You know, well, that doesn't sound right. So then I paint them backwards. I paint the south end with the red. It points to the north. No. You see, you're confused, huh? Yeah. You should be because it's confusing, right? So what I'm saying is I have, I have the earth here. Here's the earth. Right, here's the earth and it looks kind of like a cat playing with a ball. And uh, so we have the north that goes up and the south goes down here, this is the earth. And if I take this magnet right here and I, I say, you know, I'm, I'm walking along and I say, well, which end's gonna point towards the north? South. The south points to the north and the north points to the south. So then which end of the magnet do I paint? Cause the north end the part that goes up is always painted red usually, isn't it? Yeah. So which end do I paint red, the south? Oh. I didn't even know you could put a magnet on a string and it would point that way. Jeez. So then you have the red pointer goes this way. So the red pointer went on the south. What? Uh, yeah. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> it, is this because of the, the core, like the polarity? Well, Opposites right? attract, right? Yeah. Likes repel. So you try to take two north ends and put them together. Is it kind of like conventional where they just if you put the red there, but you still say it's north instead of south? Piece of mind. Strong guy, put those together. Yeah, he's strong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's what Kevin does. <laughs> 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 Come on, man. Here's a little magn
Edge. <laughs> <laughs> it's tiny little magnets. You can't put them together? Put them together. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's why I said it can get confusing. So my way of deconfusing it is to say this. You've got two ends of the magnet. Let me see. Well, right here. Two ends of the magnet. Two. Huh? Hey, yeah, you really want to try something, put them together and try to take them apart. That'll take you some time. So I say it like this. You have two ends. You have the north seeking. The north seeking. Which way is the north seeking point? North. To the north. Does that, that, I don't want to, I hate that when people say, does that make sense? It's supposed to make sense. If it doesn't, you're supposed to say something. North seeking. So which way does it point? North. To the north. How hard was that? And then we have the south seeking. And it points north. to the south. 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 See, seeking, that's the word, seeking. North seeking. And that points north. And that points south. Honestly, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. And I'm going to skip this part here, but I'll tell you, I don't know why I put it. Earth, so the Earth has a magnetic field like a bar magnet inside. So we go back to my Earth picture. It's there, there's my Earth picture. Inside the Earth, there's a bar magnet, so to speak. And so you've got the north up there at the top and the lines of flux come out, and roll back around, lines of flux go around. So that's why I say within that, or maybe it's south here and the north end of the magnet's there and that way the north end of the magnet, see what I'm saying? It's called stupid, so gotta be careful what you say. So, all right. So you have this north magnet in there. Now what did I say? Opposites attract, like repelled. Earth's magnet is actually, no, I'm not gonna say that. There was a, this book I was reading. So it's, in theory, the magnet would be upside down with the south at the top and the north, but. The south pole, the south pole. The south pole has the, the north pole has the south end of the magnet. No, see, I'm not even going there. One point I did and I tried to explain it. I'm like, you know what? Yes, the north pole is the south pole. That means it. <laughs> if you get all that, that's good, but uh, not important. All right, so let's move on with that. So A, B, C, D, E, F, we'll go G. I'm going to skip that right there. Then I'm going to say, well, what is the, this theory of this magnet? I mean, why are magnets magnets? What makes them magnets? And there's kind of two theories that work. Some of them will combine the two, which is kind of cool. And they'll say, well, really, that's just that. But there's two ways of just looking at it. And one way is the electron theory one, where if you kind of think about these electrons moving around and they're randomly orbiting inside of a piece of steel, right? Everything is random. But if I were to apply a strong enough current, I could get them all to do the same thing and create this magnetism off one end. So they all align and uh, they create a magnet of their own. What did I say here? Electrons random orbitally fields cancel each other out. But when a part is exposed to magnetic field, the atoms, electrons align, the part becomes magnetized. I don't know. Um, I like this other one. I always call the domain theory. It's the theory that I always go with and it makes because it makes more sense to me. But like I said, I've seen some books explain it to where it's actually kind of the same thing. But so if I had a piece of steel within this piece of steel, I have all these domains, which are really just little bar magnets, if you will, that are just randomly placed in here. And that's how they would normally sit, just, you know, all over the place and doing their own little thing. And that would be normal for them, right? But if I take this, this piece of steel and I place it in a very strong magnetic current, um, and I could do it several different ways. You know, one way I could actually put the plus here and put a big pad there and over here is a big minus over here and run the current right through it like that. What it's going to do is going to align all of the domains. And these all little things right there are domains. So it would line them all up. I should go back up. So each one is thought to have a little north and a south and a north and a south and a north and a south. And they just kind of are random in here. And so when I magnetize it, it lines them all up. 
So if it lines them all up, we'll say the north, south, north, south, north, south. This becomes the north end of the magnet. This becomes the south end of the magnet. Now I've created a magnet where I can actually get lines of flux that want to start flowing around through it. So once they're all lined up. So that's the domain theory versus the... And I like that one. That one makes more sense to me. So let's see. Here we have... Um, this is kind of long. It is believed... that atoms have a magnetic field. Atoms have a magnetic field. Field. Um, when uh, electrons orbit randomly, when orbit randomly, randomly, the field cancels each other out. The field So by what I'm saying is in an unmagnetized state, these uh, the atoms have a randomness to them, just like the domains have a randomness to them. There's no magnetic lines of flux flowing because like this magnet right here tends to cancel out this one over here, which is canceling out that one. So you have no magnetism in this particular bar. Same thing with the, the, the um, atoms. Um, but when it's, but <coughs> when a part is exposed, exposed to um, a magnetic field the atoms align and the part is magnetized Or we have the domain theory. The domain. Domain theory is the part contains little magnets called domains. When the part is magnetized, the domains align and the part is said to be magnetized. Domain theory is that a part contains little magnets little magnets called domains the part is magnetized part is magnetized, the domains align, and the part is magnetized. When the part is magnetized, the domains align, and the part remains magnetized. So not every part has the not every ferrous part is is the same they don't all react the same to magnetism yeah what do you mean by it remains magnetized the part so like if i have your 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 rotor and i demagnetize it and it's not magnetized i've scrambled all the domains in there so there's no lines of flux flowing anywhere right the thing is dead so you take it and you put it inside of a electromagnet or introduce magnetism through it it realigns all the domains, and I take it away, and it stays magnetized. So, like what you're doing with that, when you put in that electric field, what you're also, what you could also use a magnet to magnetize something else, yes? Yes. Okay, that's why when you take a screwdriver, magnet to it, yeah. it's magnetized. Yep. It's all theory. This is like, it works. It's true. <laughs> 
I had a student who every single night would come in and play with those in my office. Like I had things pinned on my, and just, it was just like clockwork on my office. I'd sit down after lecture, just come in, just start picking on them. So I had to hide them. Well, you gotta do again. I'll hide them. <laughs> so what is left when you remove the mag magnetizing force is residual magnetism. So residual magnetism is the magnetism that is left that is left in a part after the magnetizing force is removed. Left in a part after a magnetizing Magnetizing force is removed. One, two. Soft iron is easily magnetized. That's good. But it has low residual magnetism. All that retentivity. But on the other hand, Strong steel and where do we get strong steel from? So not all steel is the same. You got some soft steel, you got hard steel, you got really hard steel. Huh? You got carbon steel. Carbon steel, that's it. So when you say, well, all steel really has some carbon in it, but the more carbon you add to steel, the stronger it gets, but it gets brittle at a point, but it's steel with high amounts of carbon in it. So carbon steel, so strong steel, carbon steel, it's much more difficult to magnetize. Is much more difficult to magnetize. Magnetize, but has a much higher, but has a much higher residual magnetism. Okay, good question, yes. So, to bring it back to like the machine and magnetize something, if I have something that's rather soft, gears are rather soft in an engine, they're not, the teeth are hardened, but the gears are soft. Um, this is actually re reasonably soft, um, parts of it. So I put something mild steel in the Magnaflex machine or subject it to a large current and it will easily magnetize. And you could measure it while you're doing the magnetizing, and you'd say, wow, that thing is really magnetized. That was easy. It, it accepts it well. Domains all line up. Stop the current. Measure it. Where did it all go? It just kind of dissipates. It doesn't like to stay magnetized. But then you take something like a crankshaft that's been um, hardened. It's already got a lot of carbon steel, and then it's been hardened. It's been nitrated. And you magnetize it, and it takes a lot of current to really to get it to behave, to do what you want it to do. But once you do it, and you pull it out of the machine, it's like, wow, it's like it's still in there. It's like the, you, you only lose a little bit once you remove the, the magnetizing current. So that's the good thing about that. So it's hard to get it that way, but once you get it that way, it takes a lot of current. It's going to stay that way. Huh? A piece of your magnet. 
Oh, and I'll give you my magnet. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. You stuck them together too much, too hard. No. Why well, can't have nice things? Far enough, it'll go through this one-inch table. That's cool. Was cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Uh, I know. Let me see. I think we can kind of skip all that stuff right there. Okay. <laughs> there. I'm just going to leave it at that and say that was your introduction to magnets. So do I. Let me see. It's an accepted thing. It's the best guess. It's an accepted, you know, theory. So we just go with it. All right. So why why am I talking about magnets? Well, we can talk about magnetos. Obviously, the key thing is this magnet. If this loses ma magnet magnetivity, <laughs> it loses its magnetism. The whole thing's dead, right? It's not going to work. Um, and it all starts with this magnet rotating around in there, as do a lot of other things we're going to talk about in the next few days, weeks. So we've got the magnet. So we have to understand that we want it to be magnetized, we want it to stay magnetized, which means that they had to think about how they were going to make this and what it's going to be made out of. You have to have the magnet on, then off, then on, then off. So that was a, a consideration. So let me see, where am I at? Am I at number three, maybe? Magneto ignition. Magneto ignition. All right. So when you went over, when you went over magnetos, you only said one thing for the direction of rotation used in the drive in. Yeah. Is that really all that there is right now? <laughs> well, if you, that's all you remember, then I'd probably be happy <laughs> for the next two minutes. Until you have your first oral. And I'm like, no. All right. So, as I said, well, I, I, uh, let me think. Let me see. Trying to decide how much I want to write and how much I just want to talk. I'd rather just talk, but I don't think I can get away with it. So we'll just do it this way. Uh, magneto ignition. So almost all recips, almost all recip engines. What does reciprocating engine mean? Up and down. Piston. 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 Uh, they don't. Yeah, they go. Aircraft, they go up, down, side to side, yeah. all over the place. So reciprocate means a piston engine. So almost all reciprocating aircraft engines, aircraft engines, use a magneto system. A magneto system. They use two? There's two magnetos, but it's we'll call it a magneto system. Now, I don't know why this is. I wasn't my decision, but there's something about a magneto that in general aviation, you either understand and can put a magneto on an engine or you're worthless. Now, I didn't decide that, but that was somebody else did. So I just gotta tell you right now, if you can't put a magneto on an aircraft engine, you're considered, what, pond scum? Lower than, lower than low, just dirt, not worthy. What's that? Oh, a what turner? A wrench turner? No, they don't want you turning wrenches. <laughs> it's like the whole thing. It's like, I, I'm telling you, it's just the way it is. It's like, so if you sat down a bunch of guys who were going to hire a new mechanic and you all sat around and said, what should we ask them to do? They would unanimously all say the same thing. Put a magneto on. I don't know why. You know, you, it just, <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with that. But uh, it's kind of the litmus test, litmus, litmus test, in in aviation, because it combines electricity, engine stuff, which is not a fair thing to do, because you know, you could rewire my whole airplane better than a lot of people could. But right now, you don't know how to put a magneto on. You will soon enough. Then you'll be the well-rounded guy. But anyway, so I'm telling you now, you got to know this stuff. How many times did you guys put magnetos on during the summer? 
we had, we were on low end like maybe three or four times. Three or four times, one class. You get to put them on the Continental, then on the light combing, then on the other light combing, right? Yeah. So you're doing it a lot. And you do have to know how to do it. And it does kind of say, hey, you know, I understand how you know, ignition systems and engines and stuff like that. I wouldn't want somebody touching my engine who didn't know how to put a magneto on. That is for sure. I will say that. But if you didn't know how to do mags, I would say, well, you just stay on the other side of the firewall. You'll be fine. So, all right. Um, so they use this magneto system. And you got to know how to work it. If you don't know how to work it, then anyway, there are several types. Several types, several uh, different types. All right, so we have, and what you're going to see nowadays is all high tension. And high tension, tension is another way of saying voltage for some reason at this point. So that's high voltage. High voltage leaves the magneto. leaves the magneto and goes directly to the spark plug and goes directly to the spark plug via the spark plug wire. When you guys are doing your orals, you always forget that. It comes out of the distributor and goes to the spark plug. So where's the spark plug go? It just kind of screws into the end of this thing right here? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a wire that goes to the spark plug. It goes directly to the spark plug. Um, there are the two types. We have the single mag. Single mag, which is dual magnetos. And we have the dual mag, <laughs> which is a single magneto. Is that, that pretty clear? Yeah. So you either have the single mag, which is this one, whereby you would need dual magnetos. One on each, one on the right, one on the left. Or you have a single mag, otherwise known as the dual mag. Okay. That's dumb. <laughs> I agree. That's why I wrote it that way, just so you would see how dumb it is. But that is the way to do it. So whenever I'm talking to somebody and they, you know, I always have to clarify, you know, which, which, you know, system you have. Well, I got the dual mag. You have one or two. I mean, it's just, you know, roll my eyes. You mean one or two? <laughs> two. Because you have the single mag, you have two of them. <laughs> so, two yeah. Well, two two single mags. So they call it dual mags because there's two of them. <laughs> so the dual mag would just come in like one. Comes in one, but it's two together, so you call it a dual mag. So would it, would it be more or less in reference to how many components or parts are in this? I know, that's why I say I always clarify. Just to get right down to it. How many are on your engine? One or two? See, try to always break it down to something that's not ambiguous. Like if somebody was calling me in the shop, hey, I need my mag, need overhaul. My, you know, well, what do you got? Well, I got the dual mag. How many are you going to send me? One or two? You know? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, before that, there was the low tension. The low tension magnetos. Um, so what, what you had back then was low voltage. Low voltage leaves the magneto. And for those of you that know, which side is the lo was the low, low voltage side? Left side, Very, you were close. What? Right side. Just as close. <laughs> well, top side. The primary, the primary side. Yeah. Right. So the primary side is the the is that. So low voltage leaves the magneto, and must be transformed and must be transformed. Must be transformed into high voltage. voltage by individual coils. And that was older, 
older. Pre, I don't know, I think it's pre WW2 aircraft. And there were some problems inherent with that one, getting the voltage, the low voltage over to the coils. And I don't remember what all the problems were. It is, but at the same time, you have all these multiple coils, so it could be thought of that, well, if one coil fails, you still got the rest of them to go instead of that. But um, I think they had a lot of problems, especially when they got wet, they didn't want to work well because uh, you had to have low, you had low voltage leaving the magneto had to travel over to the high voltage. So any sort of uh, resistance that was built up in there, it had to overcome that resistance to get to the coil, then the coil, go to the coil, then another wire going off to the uh, spark plug. So it was the problem getting that low voltage across, if I remember correctly, what, what the big deal was. All right, so all aircraft, with maybe an exception that I don't know about, use dual ignition. So all aircraft. that I know, use, let me see, I don't want to say that, use dual ignition, there's that word again, what does that mean? <laughs> In this sense, it means two separate ignitions, it does, it's the same thing, it can be these two right here, that's two separate, it's a right and a left, or it means this one, this is two separate, it's got a right and a left. Right? It just has a common drive, but it's still two sets of points, two rotors, two coils, two distributor blocks, two distributor gears. It's two of everything except for the shaft. That's it. So, so you can turn one on, turn the other one off. So, which means that it's going to go to the cylinders, and every single cylinder is then going to have two spark plugs. Two spark plugs. I wanted to say that. So, I can't. So, all right, use two sparks. So, use dual ignition. Why dual ignition? Well, first of all, that means two spark plugs. Two spark plugs per cylinder. Which means that my aircraft has 12 spark plugs. The 310 has 24 spark plugs. Spark plugs are how much a piece? Six bucks. Twenty-five. You're getting closer. They're you're actually not far off. They're about I think roughly they're about thirty-six to forty bucks. About forty bucks per spark plug. If you buy the cheap ones, if you buy the fine wire ones, I think they're close to one hundred and forty bucks a piece. Hundred. They're they're hundred some a piece. For one spark plug. And the 310, like I said, has 24. So $2,500 for a set of spark plugs. And here's what's worse. They say never drop a spark plug once. You always spark, drop it twice. It means if you drop a spark plug on an aircraft, you pick it up and throw it away. You don't inspect it. You don't. Nothing. It's just garbage. When it hits the floor, it's garbage. Because the porcelain inside will have hairline cracks. It will. And then in flight, it'll show up because now, unlike cars, one of the problems that we have is that cars don't go to high altitudes. I mean, what's the highest you can take a car to? Oh, hey, you know, in the United States, what's the highest road we'd have? But you know, who's going to go at pipe speed? But anyway, if you did, that's a 10,000? Okay. But outside of that, what's a normal? Okay, that's only uh, eight. Okay, so, well, okay, so 10, that's still pretty high, but, you know, I don't take my aircraft much over that, but mine will go to 12, no, I've had mine up to over 14,000, so, in a nice updraft. Uh, if you're talking about a turbocharged aircraft, they're going to blow right past that and keep on going. So they're going to be really high up in the air. And what happens is, as you go higher and higher in the air, you start losing the air pressure, you start losing air pressure, Air is an insulator. You start losing your insulator. You start getting things sparking all over the place. It doesn't work very well. So we get all these problems that happen. So, you know, it's something else to look forward to. But anyway, uh, that was kind of off the subject. So we've got two plugs per cylinder, which means that we have more efficient burn. 
more efficient burn. They set it up. So you have two spark points. Starts the flame front on two different ends. They meet in the middle. Some aircraft, because of the mixture of fuel and air, one side is richer and one side's leaner, they actually stagger it. Like you'll start your timing, one will spark at 28 and the other spark at like 30 degrees. And then they'll meet in the middle. One starts before the other one. And not only do you get a more efficient burn, if you don't believe me, one of the things we do before we take off in an aircraft is we turn off one of the ignition systems and see if it still runs on the other one. Then we go back to both and run them both for a second. Then we turn off the other one to make sure it runs on. So it runs on the right by itself, runs on the left by itself. And when you do that, you see about 100 R 75 to 100 RPM drop. It's just a loss in power by, by that much RPM. So you get a more efficient burn and you get safety with redundancy. Oh, that's it, yeah. Stuff. Oh, then it really doesn't want to work. That's where I was going with that. I think it's even worse. That's why when you put the spark plug in like a tester, it's like pressurized. That's where you pressurize it. Well, that's, eh, because you, you're testing it in the cylinder. But, yeah, I just think that's when problems start showing up, especially is at altitude. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, break time.